Fifteenth of May, nineteen forty-four. Something odd approached the coast of Norfolk on England's east coast. An Aero engine was heard coming from the murky North Sea, completely unexpected. And then, out of the clouds, emerged a German aircraft, a single-engined, the twin-seat Messerschmitt Bf 109 fighter. This in itself was extremely odd. The Bf 109 was very low, and had lowered its undercarriage, not normal for a raider, but in fact the acknowledged sign that the pilot was trying to surrender. Norfolk, like elsewhere in eastern England, had had its share of air raids since 1940, with two particularly heavy fire raids in 1942 that had done enormous damage to the city of Norwich. But enemy air activity had reduced by 1944 to occasional raids made by twin-engine bombers. Single-engine planes flying this far north were extremely rare. This was in the lull before Hitler unleashed the V-1 cruise missile campaign against London, with many of these robot bombs falling in the counties around the capital and even further afield, including Norfolk. Passing over the small village of Hopton-on-Sea, the plane's undercarriage was suddenly retracted, and the 109 appeared to line up on Herringfleet Common, a wide expanse of greenery between the villages of St. Olav's and Summerleyton. It looked as though the pilot was going to make a wheels-up landing, and that indeed was the Luftwaffe pilot's intention. Oberfeldwebel, or senior sergeant Karl Wimberger, an Austrian, had taken off hours before on a routine training mission from his base at Zerbst near Dessau in Germany, where he had been assigned to the 1st Squadron of Jagdfliegerschule 102, a day fighter training school after he had washed out of night fighter school. Not a particularly good pilot, Wimberger had not been pleased when Austria had been swallowed by Nazi Germany in 1938, and he found himself drafted into the Luftwaffe. Posted to Vienna for initial flying training when war broke out, he had absolutely no desire to fight for Germany or Adolf Hitler. After training, he was sent successively to two target-towing units, not exactly glamorous work, one in Germany and one in Norway, before being posted to a night fighter training school where he ended up in hospital following a crash. Transferred to the day fighter school, he came to a decision. When the opportunity presented itself, Wimberger would defect to England. That opportunity arrived only seven days after he himself had arrived at the school. On the afternoon of the 15th of May, 1944, Wimberger was sent aloft, alone, on a solo training mission, piloting a fully fueled Messerschmitt Bf 109 G-12 training aircraft. Slung below the midline was a 66-gallon, or 300-litre, drop tank, which were fitted as standard to the Messerschmitt 109 G-12 training aircraft because modifications to the fuselage during conversion from a fighter aircraft to a trainer had reduced the integral fuel capacity to only 240 litres. The G-12 variant of the 109 fighter ended up being quite a rare bird, production run of 500 was planned, but in the end only about 100 were produced by converting old, worn-out, single-seater G2s, 4s and 6s. The aircraft's weapons had also been removed, and Wimberger's plane was camouflaged in a mottled grey scheme on the upper fuselage and upper surfaces of the wings. The problems Wimberger faced in getting to England were immense. The closest point was some 435 miles away, and he would have to fly right across German-occupied Western Europe, out over the North Sea via the Netherlands, and then penetrate the heavily defended British airspace and find somewhere to land. Wimberger had memorized the course, and he quickly climbed to 6,500 feet into clouds and began to head northwest. Incredibly, Wimberger managed to fly 400 miles through German-controlled airspace without arousing suspicion, mostly keeping to clouds for cover. And the last part of the journey, as he approached the Norfolk coast, was made at quite low altitude, possibly screening him from radar detection by the British, the low cloud cover also aiding his journey. No anti-aircraft batteries opened fire as he crossed the coast, and he was not intercepted by any RAF fighters. 
At 7 p.m., Wimberger had retracted his wheels and lined up to make a belly landing on Herringfleet Common, but disaster struck. He overshot his intended landing ground and clipped the top of a large tree, ploughing into a small valley beyond, the 109 breaking up as it smashed into the incline. Locals had heard and then seen the plane pass by, noting its German markings, and had heard the crash and rushed to see what had occurred. The 109 ended up in three pieces, but miraculously, Wimberger was still alive, trapped in his damaged cockpit. One of the first people on the scene was a local home guard sergeant. He managed to open the cockpit and pull Wimberger out, laying him on the ground. Despite being in considerable pain from a broken left leg and bleeding badly from a lacerated left wrist, Wimberger's spirits appeared to be high. Where am I? Wimberger asked in English. England, was the surprised sergeant's reply. Good, said Wimberger in a weak voice. He was hospitalised at Lowestoft and then carefully debriefed while in an RAF hospital at Lingfield in Surrey the RAF keen to learn anything of intelligence value from the defector, before he was probably sent to a prisoner of war camp for the duration of the war, though under an agreed cover story to prevent the other prisoners accusing him of treachery and perhaps even punishing him. Wimberger's shattered plane was gathered up and also carefully examined by the RAF before being recycled for scrap though I'd be surprised if a few pieces didn't end up being retained by locals as souvenirs of their unexpected May 1944 visitor. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.